My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, former member of the Students for a Democratic Society, Weatherman, and the Weather Underground, Kathy Wilkerson, to discuss her book, Flying Close to the Sun. There was an, an enormously wide range of views from people who thought that what we were doing and what they wanted to do was to uh, push the Democratic Party to take on more of the critical questions of the time and to challenge their pro-war stance and to encourage them to deal with the issue of poverty and to force them to deal with the, what was happening in the South and civil rights. So the end, when there were a lot of people in SDS who joined because they were part of the cultural movement and saw SDS as a forum for sort of having a voice, sort of a cultural voice in the public forum as opposed to a political voice. And, of course, by the late 60s, there were people who defined themselves as revolutionary communists, and all of us were together. Every single interview from the Marketplace of Ideas is available on our online archive. Visit us at www.colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace. You can download each show, or you can stream any of them in your browser. Join the International Marketplace of Ideas listening community by adding yourself to our Frapper listener map. The link is right on our front page, ColinMarshallRadio.com slash Marketplace. My guest is Kathy Wilkerson, former member of the Students for a Democratic Society, Weatherman and the Weather Underground. Her new book, examining her experiences as a 1960s radical, is Flying Close to the Sun, My Life and Times as a Weatherman. Kathy, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Thank you. What made now time to tell this story? Well, I had personal reasons because I, my kids were grown and I had this, uh, the space to sit down and write it, um, which took me a long time and because uh, I was working for most of that time as well. But also I think that uh, increasingly I began to feel that the issues that we explored in the 60s had relevance, although not knee-jerk applications for today's young people. What sort of issues are the ones that have come back for today's youth? Well, for instance, the issue of women and what it means to really have women respected within progressive movements and within society at large, I think, is critical. I also think we began a a conversation about equality. We didn't begin, but we continued a conversation about equality in the 60s with the new dimension of equality in the context of diversity. Most conversations in the United States about equality up until then had assumed a sort of melting pot uh, philosophy that everybody would be um, join the dominant culture. Now I think uh, it's very clear that we're dealing with equality in the context of cultural uh, diversity, which is a wonderful thing, but not so easy to achieve. And we just began to have that conversation in the 60s. I think it's full-flung now, but knowing the history of that is critically important. And finally, I think the issue of violence, power, and social change is critical, whether we're talking about the presidency of the United States or uh, uh, activist movements in defense of labor and uh, minorities and the Constitution, to be honest. Well, I'm definitely going to touch on all that stuff, but first I want to ask you a question about the book itself, in that it's not simply a memoir of your time as an activist, but it's almost a complete autobiography to date. It starts in your childhood. And what in your early life made you more open to the idea of activism and later radical activism? Well, I began with the early period because I think it's fascinating how young people form a global view of the world and begin to define themselves in relationship to the rest of the world. So issue of gender, race, and class are all very important up until a child is a pre-adolescent. 
And really, it's during those years that a child gets clues about what to dream, what to imagine, and what obstacles they see themselves facing. So I wanted to start with my own early years to sort of model that. And, of course, as an educator working in inner-city schools, I have come to understand how critically important those years are in the development of political consciousness. What were your clues growing up that you would want to turn your attention toward what you did? Well, I went to public school in rural Connecticut, and we said the Pledge of uh, Allegiance to the Flag every morning and sang three patriotic songs and said the Lord's Prayer because it was before the Supreme Court decision. And what stuck with me from all of that was for liberty and justice for all. Mm -hmm. And I looked around me, and as I grew older, even as young as seven or eight, I began to see instances where that was not true and where, in fact, I could see, even as a child, that the playing field was not level and that there wasn't equal access to democracy. And the 50s was a big time for promoting democracy and patriotism, and I inhaled all of that and read childhood biographies of early the early United States, and I thought democracy was a great thing, but we didn't yet completely have it. And and I so when I began to hear about the civil rights movement as a high school student, I thought, well, these are people who are really working to bring that democracy to a more equal playing field. The civil rights movement was the first one to catch your attention as a large-scale push for equality. Yes, although I was aware of the anti-nuclear movement also, because as children we were terrified by the nuclear weapons, and I had seen... Uh, survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the Quaker Church where my mother brought us and um, was horrified by what we had done. And so I was aware of the nuclear uh, problem, but there had, was not a large anti-nuclear movement, whereas the civil rights movement, you could tell, was reaching down into the marrow of the bones of this country. Were you more fearful about what the future might be without activism, or were you more optimistic for change that you could do? Well, I, I think what I just said is a starting off point for that, because certainly an awareness of nuclear weapons made me aware, but very fearful. And it wasn't until I was introduced to the civil rights movement and, and early student activism of Students for Democratic Society, SDS, that I began to be hopeful that here were young people with an imagination of how it could be better who were joining together in a community to support each other and to fight for that reality. Tell me about how SDS began to draw your attention initially. How did you know they were going to be a place for you? Um, well, I my first exposure to SDS was on a campus chapter in which I felt more or less completely excluded, partly because of my gender. It was uh, all, all, the only speakers were male, but partly because of my own ignorance, um, having not been raised in a progressive tradition and not knowing very much about the history of the country. Um, but they later drew, drew me into community organizing and participating in the civil rights movement. And they became for me the way that I could enter into the public forum and have a voice in the big issues of the day and in the future of the country. Tell me about the nature of the SDS when you joined. What kind of organization was it? You mentioned that it was male-dominated, but in what other ways was it different an organization than when you made the switch to the weatherman? Well, when I was exposed to it in college, it was very male-dominated. But after college, I went and worked in the national office and had a much broader and, and also had exposure in its community organizing aspects, um, which were not necessarily male-dominated. And I, SDS was a huge, rapidly growing organization that was utterly accessible and completely chaotic, and really what SDS was, a public forum where young people could come together and debate the issues of the day on a national level, and on a local level could get together and uh, figure out what campaigns and what issues to work on. As a national organization, it was very accessible, but could never pass a consistent 
program from one national meeting to the next because our structure was very primitive and inept and unable to deal with our size. You do mention a few times in the book the problem of chaos, the problem of of vagueness of aims. How wide a range of views was there in SDS? How much disagreement was there? There was an, an enormously wide range of views from people who thought that what we were doing and what they wanted to do was to uh, push the Democratic Party to take on more of the critical questions of the time and to challenge their pro-war stance um, and to uh, uh, encourage them to deal with the issue of poverty and to force them to deal with the, what was happening in the South and civil rights. Um, that was a significant part of SDS, particularly at the beginning, uh, till the end when there were a lot of people in SDS who joined because they were part of the cultural movement and saw SDS as a forum for sort of youth, um, youth having a voice, sort of a cultural voice in the public forum as opposed to a political voice. And, of course, by the late 60s, there were people who defined themselves as revolutionary communists. Mm-hmm. And all, and, but still people who were working for the Democratic Party, and all of us were together. So there was some conflict, but you all, you all remained in the organization, seeing it as a way to get things done ultimately? Well, the SDS was highly functional on the local level. Mm. It was never functional on the national level, other than as a, for, a place, a gathering place for people to come and, and try to figure out what they thought and try to prioritize. We weren't successful, but the effort was highly successful in that it, it, I got my education about the world at those meetings, basically. Um, but in terms of actually engaging the war machine, closing down draft uh, induction centers, educating students one-on-one about the farm workers' strike, about racism, about the war in Vietnam, that actual work happened at the local level. What did you find worked locally as far as local activism, local programs you could put in effect? Well, I worked in Washington for the last three years of the 60s, or two and a half years, and I, we worked very hard on the farm workers who were for the first time organizing in California and had a strike on against grapes to force uh, the growers to accept the idea of unionism. Um, which they were not accepting, and anyone who fought for union was thrown out and uh, kicked out and blacklisted and not allowed to work. And um, so we worked a lot on the farm workers. We worked to support the Black Panther Party, who were under ferocious attack from the FBI at that time, who was uh, not only gathering intelligence but using that intelligence to stir up internecine fights within the organization that resulted in several of the leadership being killed, and people were also stopped randomly. I mean, they were under great attack. So we did a lot to publicize the 10-point Black Panther program, what they stood for, what they were trying to do. And we fought against the, the war by identifying local perpetrators on campuses, like who was researching material to help the military fight the war, where what what kind of defense money was coming into the university, how is it influencing university policy, and also uh, the university's role in the community. People began to increasingly get involved in that. And those were just a few of the ways that SDS people in Washington um, were active. We also had an underground press, many of whose writers were members of SDS, People contributed to power structure research for the other um, national publications, trying to sort out and tease out what was going on here, who was who, and how were they managing to suppress equality so effectively in the name of uh, the profit for the stockholders, um, and what should we do about it? How much of the a unifying force was the Vietnam War as opposed to the civil rights movement for student activists? Which one brought more together? Well, everything that happened in the 60s was built on the foundation of the civil rights movement of the 50s and early 60s. I mean, the civil rights, without the civil rights movement, none of the other rest of it would have happened in any way 
similar to what actually happened because the civil rights movement engaged power. They actually changed the paradigm, the conversation around race and equality in this country in a fundamental way. And that movement had been was part of a movement that had been going on for 150 years, and people had very carefully laid the basis for the court cases that kind of touched off the uh, movement in the 50s. But then young people jumped in and played a pivotal, pivotal critical role in creating, being very creative and also putting themselves forward at great personal sacrifice to appeal to the moral conscience of the nation. And that successful engagement with power made everyone in the 60s feel like we could succeed at ending power, at ending poverty, and at ending the war. And we didn't quite realize the difference in the sort of the size of the problems that we were taking on. Not that racism as a problem isn't huge, but but the civil rights movement did change Jim Crow laws. They did change the voting laws. Um, they did change very concrete things around school integration that had to be fought for school by school to be enforced, but they changed, the, the as I said, the paradigm. So the changing U.S. foreign policy was a much larger problem. Tell me a little about the misconception of the scale of that. What was the view of the problem as opposed to the problem itself? Well, we began to understand the enormity of the problem, that the relationship between foreign policy and economic policy, and that uh, foreign policy grew directly out of the belief that one's economy had to continue to expand. It wasn't enough to have a little business that, paid for the workers and paid for the people who owned it and successfully produced a profit. If you didn't expand, you would be put out of business. And so there was this hungry need to expand our access to natural resources, to expand our need for cheap labor, to expand our need for financial investment. And it was that need to expand at the cost of untold human suffering and at the cost at the cost of increasing inequality that we began to put together uh, in a mass way by the end of the 60s. Some people always understood that, but many of us had no inkling of that when we started out in the movement, and it wasn't until the late 60s, literally, that hundreds of thousands of young people began to understand that and have acted on that understanding ever since. The movement was very hopeful and optimistic uh, all through the 60s, but in 1968, King was killed, Kennedy was killed, several members of the leaders of the Black Panther Party were killed. Uh, there was an enormous movement to turn back civil rights. There was stoning of buses in northern cities carrying young black children to integrate schools. And the war continued to escalate. So by 1969, we began to feel like we were under attack, that the legitimate movement was not going to be listened to, and in fact, the FBI, um, which turned out to be true, was going to identify leaders of all of the uh, dissent in the United States and round them up. And indeed, COINTELPRO did say, uh, we, we later learned from Watergate and, and papers exposed after that, that the FBI had put out a directive to every single off saying, office saying that they... Uh, agents had to neutralize the leadership of all of our organizations, and in particular neutralize the leadership of the Black Panther Party and, quote, prevent the rise of a black messiah. And we can look back at the killings of black leadership in the late 60s and wonder, you know, about each and every one of those, where those came from. And they've never, people have never been prosecuted for those. So we felt under attack, and it was that feeling of being under attack and ignored politically that led people to become increasingly militant. And also the GIs were beginning to, um, to uh, protest against the war in increasing numbers, and veterans were beginning to speak out, and they were very upset and angry about what they had seen, what they had been forced to do, what was going on over there about the betrayal of the troops. So the level of anger reached a fever pitch, and there was a 
great urgency about doing something about this so we wouldn't have to watch children burning up with napalm on the TV every night. And it was that sense of urgency, I think, that led many people across all of the movements to become more militant. And, and we were, it was a combination of both offense and defense. Tell me about the splintering of the SDS, and especially with the creation of the Weatherman faction. How did that happen? Well, given the enormity, how huge SDS became, and how inadequate our national structure was, groups of people had begun to peel off from SDS early on. And plus, there was the problem of what happens when you grow up, and you are not a student anymore, or young enough to organize students. And... That's what happened to me in 1969. I was 24, and I had been working with students for six or seven years, and I felt like I wanted to work with grown-ups, um, that it was time for me to move on. And I was looking for a place to engage with power more directly. And I think a lot of people were looking for that, and, and all kinds of groups formed out of SDS to go do that based on the wide range of opinions still from revolutionary to democratic party, embraced in SDS. And a small number, and for me, I joined Weatherman, which was a very small faction, um, because they were the angriest people out there. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't quite understand what their strategy was. didn't really make sense to me as somebody who had been an organizer for years. But I appreciated the fact that they were really angry and I also appreciated that they were very uh, focused on the issue of race and about including the challenge of racism in every conversation. You mentioned that their strategy was hard to grasp for you at the time. How, how coherent <laughs> was it in an absolute sense? Well, I have no idea what all the different people thought about it, and weatherman varied tremendously from city to city. So it... it the, the, the strategy in 69 really was to just, as far as I could tell, to just be angry mm. um, and to be get in people's faces and say, you can't continue to lead your life in this ho-hum way you're doing it. You must address the war. You must address the pro- questions of poverty and race and racism. Um, and it's, it's immoral to go on and continue to just shop uh, and ignore this stuff. So that was very appealing to me at that point. I was so angry and frustrated about what was happening. Um, By 1970, of course, that anger, that kind of public display of anger, uh, picking fights, challenging people at demonstrations, doing outrageous things, um, that morphed into um, more talk about uh, taking on the United States government militarily as absurd as that seems. At the time, did they, did they know it was, as you said, absurd to take on the U.S. militarily, but was it more an iconic sort of strategy for them, like they just wanted to, they wanted to know that they were doing that more so than they thought they could actually defeat the U.S. government, or was the idea that they could literally win? Well, I have to stress here again that Weatherman was not a united, monolithic entity, that it really... People uh, had very different tendencies in different cities on this, and there was no forum to discuss and arrive at sort of a common opinion because because by that time the police attacks were just so relentless and they had infiltrated. We were beginning to figure out that they were using this information to hurt people. Uh, So there was a tremendous emphasis on secrecy, which led to an extremely hierarchical organization. Um, And so there was very little communication among all the people in Weatherman by the end of 69. Uh, And so I, being in just one little group, only knew what my group thought. Uh, And I was in one group that was kind of confused and didn't know what to do, and then I later moved to the New York group uh, where there was a very, which really believed that uh, we, like uh, Vietnam, needed to begin to 
develop the capacity to take on the United States government militarily, even though we recognized we were at the beginning of that stage. Other groups had been doing fire bombings and all kinds of um, much more militant actions for at least a year, and we felt like we needed to learn how to do that and do it in a secret way. How comfortable were you with these actions, the fire bombings, and various forms of destruction that they were using to get in the public eye? Well, I wasn't at all comfortable with it, but I was so angry at what was happening mm-hmm. and so desirous of having a voice, of not being silenced by the government, um, that I was willing to stick my neck out and learn how to do this. Um, and again, events were moving so rapidly at that time. The war was so urgent. The FBI and the police at that time were so active in the movement that every day felt like maybe this was the last day you were going to get to fight, so you better fight really hard that day. Um, And we felt like maybe it was 1938 in Germany, and Mm. were we going to be good Germans and go along with the Holocaust, or were we going to develop a resistance? So it was that kind of a mentality. And so we didn't talk about the political implications. At a certain point, we just dropped that as time-consuming and focused on who's the enemy, who can we hit, how can we hit them. You mentioned in the book that the idea with many members became simply, as you said, to hit as hard as possible and how much of an idea was there about what might develop should they successfully smash what they wanted to smash, be it the state, be it the established order? Well, in New York, in the New York group uh, where uh, the explosion happened in the townhouse and we were developing uh, a a pipe bomb to use against the officers in the military, um, we never discussed whether we were trying to kill anybody or not, which wasn't really in my mind at the time at all. It was more like if they're going to create this chaos on a daily basis and be killing people, they have to be aware of what this looks like physically in the United States. We're so protected from the consequences of war that we wanted to do some tiny little thing to generate an environment of war that people would then have to say, well, maybe the war will come home to this country, and we should think a little bit harder about bringing war to other people. I never thought about what the political consequences or the human consequences would be. Because when you cross that threshold to using weapons of war, you have to dehumanize the enemy. For those just tuning in, my guest is Kathy Wilkerson, a former 1960s student activist, member of Students for a Democratic Society, Weatherman, and The Weather Underground. Her book is Flying Close to the Sun, My Life and Times as a Weatherman. We slipped without ever thinking about it into that mode because the only thing that distinguishes warfare from murder is that dehumanizing of the enemy and somehow that it's legitimate. Some people are subhuman and can be killed with different consequences than it is to kill human beings. Who was your group's enemy specifically, and how were you able to, in your minds, dehumanize them? Uh, Well, we dehumanize them by not thinking about it, by just not dealing with it in our particular case. And I think also that, to some extent, some of the rhetoric of the 60s calling policemen, pigs, and all of that was part of that process of dehumanizing, uh, or it had that effect. I don't think anybody did that intentionally, but it certainly had that effect. Um, and so I, I think it, I, part of why I wrote the book is I feel like we in the United States accept this dehumanization of war because we have to get up every day and go about our business, and we have to accept that uh, massive numbers of civilians are suffering on a daily basis because of our foreign policy. And women in Afghanistan will be affected for generations, their reproductive systems, by the um, uh, uh, depleted uranium bombs that we use there. So we have to, and I, and I feel like we have to fight against that dehumanization dehumanization somehow 
and and never let ourselves be accustomed to it without an enormous amount of unease. It may be that we can't stop the war in Iraq at the moment. It may be that we can't make the government have a coherent policy in Afghanistan because the economy depends on the foreign policy that exists. But we ha- we can't allow ourselves to go through that dehumanizing. So then ha- the question, the way I would pose the question today is how do you live your life on a daily basis when you live in that in a world where all of this is happening? Do you join a gated community uh, and ignore it and stake your lot with the people who are causing this? Or do you live in the midst of the contradictions and try to create community in a way that sustains us while we try to change what's happening? And at that period, it was the contradictions that were really getting to you and pushing you forward then. Yes, and I didn't have the sense of the strength of community and the importance of that that I now have, you know, 40 years later. Because I was young and I was angry and I was, you know, who knows when you're 24 what you know when you're 60. (laughs) Now, all this time in SDS and in the Weatherman, tell me about the place of women's rights, a special interest of yours, one you tried to introduce into the movement. Well, I, I, was a, I learned from the early activists in the women's movement. I was not one of the early activists myself, but I, but I listened attentively, and I began to understand what they were saying. And we, the late 60s, we had this absurd debate among women about whether the women's movement should be a gathering of women separately to analyze the issues of women and fight for women, or whether women should, the purpose of it was to recruit women into the anti-war and anti-racism movements. Um, And obviously now we understand you have to do both. Um, But at the time, again, this sense of urgency that every day mattered, you had to do the most, figure out what the most important thing was and do that, um, sort of defined our politics. So when I... I was, but I was going in that direction. I became very active in the spring of '69 in organizing around women in the Washington area. We put together a pamphlet on women and the history of women's activism, and I that I was very excited about. And so when I when I joined Weatherman, which was not at the beginning, but a few months into it, I posed this question to Weatherman, and it, what happened was that I was told that I was completely wrong that my support for women was racist and privileged and that if I was really willing to confront my privilege, I would abandon this fight for women and that the goal of women should be to bring women to the forefront of the fight against the war. And I was not convinced, but I submitted, Mm. uh, so to speak, um, because I felt so confused and so desperate to do something. And that continued to be Weatherman's position throughout its existence. Um, and so while it, it fronted very active women it's in, in its internal life, it was not a healthy place for women. Tell me about the transition between Weatherman and the Weather Underground. Uh, well, it was I, the main thing I can say is it was unplanned, mm. <laughs> and so the the accident that happened in New York in the townhouse with the explosion that killed three people, uh, Teddy Gold, Terry Robbins, and Diana Outen, um, meant that the police were going to just swarm, and so anybody who was associated with Weatherman sort of just disappeared under the public radar, and however they could, and most of those people managed to stay in touch. Some of them never did get back in touch. Um, And so it was very chaotic, and while people had been, some people had been talking about this as the direction they were going in, other people, like myself, knew almost nothing about that talk. And so it just happened. Um, And then all of a sudden, we were removed from the public forum, except in those very limited instances where around when we did actions after that, uh, when we had a public voice. But that voice was only the voice of the leadership. 
Now, I should have clarified for the listeners who don't know the story that the townhouse in question was, in fact, your father's? My parents were away on vacation. I came to New York in uh, February and joined this group of weathermen, and we needed a place to stay and a place to work. Uh, and I was able to obtain the keys from my father and stepmother through a, a ruse, and we were staying there uh, for the week before we were going to do this action, and uh, they were going to come back that night of the, the night of the action. So we were both making final preparations for the action, and also I, we were cleaning the house to make sure that they would not know that we had ever been there. How did you escape? Um, well, the, there were uh, two people in the basement at the time, uh, apparently there was something went wrong. One of the devices went off. Uh, it then, uh, and a device went off and set off one of the boxes of dynamite that was down there. Uh, in, Weatherman was not given to moderation, so mm-hmm. when we needed dynamite, we didn't just get enough dynamite for this one action. We got enough dynamite um, to build a building. Uh, and so there were a couple of, at least a couple of boxes of dynamite down there, and the device set off at least one of them. Uh, and that was the, that was what gave the blast its enormous impact. Um, and so the house disintegrated, and I was upstairs in it, the floor, I was actually ironing sheets at the time, and, um, the floor sank, the ironing board tilted the other way, and I realized that already a fire had started in the basement and that I had just seconds to get out of the house. So there weren't any floors or windows anymore. I just headed for daylight. And you were able to escape, and at that point on, you were, you were on the run. Your picture, which is included in the book, was up in the post office, and your face was known. How did you escape detection? Um, well, I, I'm quite certain that I was recognized by other young people on a number of occasions, but people didn't tell. Uh, mm. While most people disagreed with Weatherman, particularly at that stage, um, everybody, many hundreds, tens if not hundreds of thousands of young people felt that angry. And so and didn't know what to do about it, didn't know what else to do about it. So while they disagreed with Weatherman, they had a certain sympathy for Weatherman going out on a limb like that. And later, when we did uh, bombings that were very carefully done to make sure that no one got hurt, although with bombings you can never be 100% sure, um, but we targeted corporate and military and government uh, institutions that were the most active in the war and most active in perpetrating racism, um, attacks, particularly attacks on young people of color. Um, we, many people supported those actions because there was no loss of life, um, and it was a symbolic expression of anger. So we could not have existed without a massive amount of support. Um, and... Uh, and uh, and we were lucky. <laughs> I was lucky. <laughs> so when the Vietnam conflict ended, when the U.S. finally pulled out of the country, how did that change the collection? Now, I guess it's less an organization than various groups of angry young activists. How, how did they change when they didn't have that to rally around? Well, I think um, when the war... Uh, when they began to withdraw U.S. troops in massive numbers, it it definitely made a difference in the strength of the anti-war movement. Um, but with the war was the immediate, urgent um, reason for m- many of the people in the movement to stay in it. It wasn't the only reason, but it was the most immediate and urgent for many people. For some people like myself, the issue of race was equally important, or the issue of women. Um, But certainly the war was the unifying factor for all of us. And so when the war ended, and ended in a way uh, that was not horribly violent, or, I mean, it was violent, obviously, but 
and there was enormous chaos in Vietnam afterwards. But there, because there was a strong governmental entity to take over in Vietnam, there was less chaos than, say, what we see in Iraq. Um, and this was a, a political entity that had a long history, so a 50-year history in the country and had a massive amount of support. Uh, so it, there was less chaos and less violence than there could have been. And I think that because of that, the anti-war movement felt like it, it had done its job. Um, and it, you know, and, and people were exhausted and also people were older and raising families and needed to work. Uh, and so there wasn't a pool of free labor that there had been in the 60s when many people put off getting careers for 10 years and worked really full-time for the movement. And also all the GIs and veterans who had, I mean, if anyone ended the war, it was them hmm. uh, in a lot of ways. They were badly wounded physically and emotionally and mentally and needed to recover, uh, needed to get jobs. I mean, people needed to, to lick their wounds and also to figure out how to settle in for the long haul. And that's when tens of thousands of people, I mean, I laugh when people say the 60s ended and people abandoned their ideals because everybody didn't know, oh, no one I know, uh, other than David Horowitz, who I didn't know, <laughs> abandoned their ideals. And people went into you know, organic agriculture, the environmental movement, they went into uh, health and education, they went into uh, new business models. I mean, people settled everywhere in the social and economic life of the country and tried to work for those same ideals, but on a much more local, uh, personal scale. You're of the opinion, then, that the SDS ideals, the student activism ideals of the 1960s, have, have lived on, but they've spread out. Oh, uh, undoubtedly. And I, I think uh, people are still trying to roll back the, the changes in the conversation and expectations that were raised really sharply during the 60s with the attempt to roll back women's equality being one example. And, and also, uh, so I, I think activists of the 60s have really just sort of defined uh, development in this country uh, or one, one of the major trends of development uh, in the last 40 years, and we, uh, and I think young people today are playing the role that we played then, which is to kind of say, we need to not get too complacent with this, and we need to continue to identify the most urgent, immediate consequences of the world we live in and work to change those. How were you different from your fellow activists? Your book has been promoted, or not promoted as, but been called a different voice from that generation, from that movement, that you have different things to say than others who are involved do now. How are you different? Well, I, I actually don't like that portrayal of it. But oh, okay. I, I, well, tell me, about that. tell me about that. I think that... Um, what happened in the 60s is tremendously complex. And to prepare for this book, I read five or six of the books that are out about SNCC, of the Southern Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee, uh, the, about the Civil Rights Movement as a whole, about the Black Panther Party, uh, about labor history, about the women's movement. I mean, I read, you know, 30 books about the 60s. And I... And I felt like it was that tapestry that mm -hmm. I had to read to really understand what was going on. And I was a participant in it. So I felt like there needed to, there needed to, that the tapestry wasn't completely complete yet. <laughs> so it was more in that spirit that I wrote the book. I thought women's voices are uh, severely underrepresented in telling the story of the 60s. And so I, felt it important to contribute my experiences. I also felt like that the issue of militancy, violence, power, and social change had not been addressed head-on and really needed to be openly discussed. And we're living now in such an atmosphere of sort of fear 
being generated by Homeland Security that people are afraid to have conversations about social change and violence, um, which is kind of absurd because our government is busy implementing social change by using violence mm. on a regular basis uh, and increasing and escalating basis. But the other difference is now I mean, we thought nuclear weapons changed everything around warfare, and we thought there could be no more war because it would be calamitous to the planet. But now we found out that you can still have warfare, even though those are hanging in the background. But the weapons of the, the weapons of warfare now are so destructive in so many ways between Agent Orange, uh, depleted uranium bombs, uh, all the chemicals that are regularly used by the United States government and other people uh, in fighting warfare, phosphorus bombs. Um, and they're also so cheap and so accessible because U.S. arms manufacturer unloaded billions and billions of dollars of handheld weapons after the end of the Cold War, mostly in Africa and Asia. And so they're everywhere, and anyone who wants a shoulder-fired missile can get one other than in the United States, pretty mm. much. And so when you have weaponry that lethal and that accessible, it has completely define the reality of most of the world. And so we need to be able to talk about this at great length and openly and look at why this is true and look at the arms industry and their enormous contributions to both Democratic and Republican parties. Um, and also figure out how do human beings stand up to this, whether we're talking about... Uh, a labor union struggle in Colombia where 200 union leaders were assassinated in the course of a year and a half, um, or whether you're talking about the Middle East with the Iraq and Palestine, or Africa where there's warfare going on around mineral mining in over half of the country right now, and uh, these big uh, mineral companies are arming local militias to defend their workers. Um, I mean, what's going on? And and people are so afraid to talk about violence that we're not talking about the reality of most people in the world. You would like more issues to be acknowledged, just in general. You'd like uh, you'd like more things to be out there on the table than currently are. Yes, and and to have this open discussion about it. The question about social change is not a question about violence versus nonviolence. We have to have a whole uh, range of strategies and be enormously creative in bringing our case, in uh, convincing people who are frightened and passive to to stand up and join the public forum, because I'm convinced that only by participating in the public forum massively and smartly with intellectual rigor and knowing what we're talking about are we going to be able to change, you know, the situation? And my, sort of where the title of the book comes from is, my question is, the human race, the human species has had a fascination with technology from since the invention of fire because it extends our power. And this course has brought us wonderful, wonderful things. But it's now plummeting us in the direction of the destruction of the species and the planet and our host planet. Um, and so are we going to be able to get it together to, to not have that happen or not? And I don't know, um, but if we are, and I think it's worth fighting to do it, <laughs> um, then it's going to come about by a massive reactivation of the population. And the response to that will be violent mm. by the people in power. And so what am I going to say the Vietnamese couldn't, shouldn't have defended themselves or that women who are being brutally attacked in uh, parts of the Congo right now or in the Middle East, uh, are, are they not to join together and defend themselves? I'm not going to say that. I think we need a range of strategies with the goal of sustained public participation in the public forum. 
When young people read your book today, people who did not live through the 1960s or even the 70s, what would you want them to understand about the 60s when they finish the book? What do you want them to come away knowing about your time in activism? Well, I, I want them to know about the conversations, basically, that we had. This, this conversation about equity in the context of diversity. How did that, what, what role did black nationalism play in that? What role has nationalism played in general in this country and globally? Uh, how, what do we think about national versus global democracy? These are conversations that, that we took steps in during the 60s and that I think are critical and also the issues around women and, and I, and secondarily I want people to understand the sophistication of the apparatus of repression and how while we need to to be outraged about it and protest against it and try to do our best to not let it completely roll over us, we also have to learn how to work within the context of that. And that means taking care of ourselves and taking care of our movement in a sustained fashion. And we didn't know how to have that conversation in the 60s because we, didn't, we were naive about the repression. Um, and so I think... There's a lot of things like that. I don't feel like I'm in a position to tell young people what to do, mm. but that, as you said, what we learned in the 60s, I think, could be helpful to them in their efforts to decide what to do. Do you think young people are learning how to have that conversation? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Uh, although I think that the 60s has been stereotyped so much that they recently there's been a trend away from learning from the 60s. Um, but I think young people today are far more aware of what's going on, and there's far more many young people who are active in one local struggle or another than, than when we were young. But I don't think they've, they've never had that experience of power and hope that we had in the civil rights movement. So they're not aware of their strengths. So I feel like seeing themselves as part of a history is part of what they need to be able to see how strong they are and how they're playing a critical role in a, in a struggle that's been going on for a long time. The book is Flying Close to the Sun. Kathy Wilkerson, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. He also goes under the names Ice Ben and DJ Concept. Check out his website, www.benalthouse, that's B-E-N-A-L-T-H-O-U-S-E, dot com. Feel free to leave your comments, questions, and reading suggestions for the audience on the Marketplace of Ideas listener hotline. The phone number is 805-585-3947. That's 805-585-3947. Be sure to check out our website, www.colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace. All feedback, please direct to colin at colinmarshallradio.com. And we hope to see you soon on the next episode of the Marketplace of Ideas.